Young activists from Bangladesh, the Philippines, and El Salvador discussed the global movement for sexual and reproductive health in Fredericton and Moncton last week as part of a tour of eastern Canada. Other stops on the speaking tour, which was organized by the Ottawa-based group Interpares, took place in the Canadian capital along with St. John's, Halifax, and Montreal. The events had a special significance in New Brunswick, a province where teenage pregnancy rates are almost double the national average and access to reproductive care remains a problem. The event came just days after a provincial election dominated by the Liberal Party, which campaigned on a pledge to improve access to abortions. The NB Media Co-op live-streamed the event in Moncton. Stay tuned to watch the full presentation. We're here on tour. Uh, we're in, we just got to Moncton today, uh, but we started uh, this tour in, in St. John's, Newfoundland. We've been to Halifax. And we'll continue on on our way to Ottawa on a tour titled Youth Activism for Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights, a conversation on the global movement for bodily autonomy. So we're you know traveling to different cities to, to open up this conversation, talk about the incredible work that our, our counterparts are, are doing in their countries, but also to connect those conversations and struggles and strategies with the work that we're doing here in Canada. Um, I work for Interpares, which, is, uh, which means in Latin, uh, amongst equals. Uh, it's an organization that's about to turn 50 next year. So we've been around for, for quite a bit. And Interpares really tries to, to challenge the, the, the traditional ways in which international cooperation is done, as well as the, way that, the work that we do here in Canada, because Interpares works in different parts of the world, in West Africa, Sudan, different parts of Asia, Latin America, but also in Canada, with the understanding that you know, we also have struggles uh, really linked to social justice in Canada, uh, that prosperity in Canada is often inter intertangled with issues in other countries, and lack of access and equality in other countries, and that we should engage Canadian public uh, with the work we're doing so that we can you know, have uh, uh, work together towards uh, better futures. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, this is part of the work. Interpares works in different uh, kinds of issues, including food sovereignty, sexual health and reproductive rights, uh, public health issues, uh, extra anti-extractive struggles. And we see them all as interconnected. So we cannot think about struggles for water, for instance, if we don't think about comprehensive sexuality education, right? Mm -hmm. So this is some of the things that we'll hope to explore here with you. And do you have a video? And yes, and I should be introducing a video. So as part of uh, one of the projects in which uh, the three counterparts here today are, um, we created uh, a photo exhibition uh, under the title Daughters, Mothers, Granddaughters, and Other Sexual Outlaws. It just closed in uh, Gallery 101 in Ottawa, and hopefully it'll be traveling to other places. But the idea was really to explore the ways in which knowledge transmission uh, happens when it comes to sexual health and reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. that, hence, you know, the, the title of the exhibition. So we'll, we'll have a little sample so that people get a little bit situated on the context in which we'll be talking about today. Yes.
introduction to some of the work that's happening so in that vein I'm wondering if each of you would like to tell us about the context in which you're working uh, what are the social norms and then a little bit about the work that you're doing you can start with you okay. uh, hi everyone good afternoon I am Chara Bantura. I'm from Bangladesh uh, uh, Bangladesh is uh, situated in the South Asia um, it's known for its uh, greenery, scenic beauty, and you know, the Royal Bengal Tiger, and we do have the longest sea beach, and also one of the fastest growing economy in the South Asia. Uh, just to give you a scale, like we are in New Brunswick, imagine the size of New, New Brunswick, mm -hmm. and think about the population of Canada, multiply it five times, and you put all of them in that. So we come from a country with 170 million people, and I live in Dhaka, which is the capital city. I I work with uh, Nijera Kuri, it is a non-profit organization. So Bangladesh is celebrating its 53 years of independence. And Nijera Kuri has been functioning with the communities for last 43 years. So when it comes to the, th the, the works that we do, uh, as a non-profit, we do have our philosophy of uh, working with the people, not for the people. So we work with the marginalized communities, like uh, people who are marginalized, even within the marginalized community. So rural men, women, and adolescents. So our main focus area has been, like in a country like Bangladesh, of course we are fastest growing, we are like, we are increasing, of course, but with the population as, as well as uh, the education rate and the life expectancy, everything is going, we are progressing, but still yet we do have some issues when it comes to social and political issues that we face uh, with uh, poverty, corruption, and also a deep-rooted stigma and growing religious conservatism uh, that is uh, ahead of us right now in Bangladesh. So, Nijera Kuri focuses on, uh, for the marginalized communities, they work with the forming local uh, landless groups and they assert their own rights and they work for the, the exploitation and discrimination that they face. So we focus on access to resources like lands, access to justice, gender equality, as well as you know the growing, curbing, curbing the growing notions of uh, for religious fundamentalism, mm -hmm. we also focus on that. Mm -hmm. As well as we focus on adolescents, young girls and women for SRHR, 
know, awareness and also information. And how it's, it's, we believe that uh, our problems can't be solved by anyone. Like the communities that they go through the discrimination and exploitation, not a third person can do that. So we do, do not focus on service delivery, rather than we work or focus on, we prioritize conscientization method that the people should be more aware. And we do provide them certain tools and equip them how to get, like, hold accountable to the communities and how to hold accountable the state, mm -hmm. the authority, mm -hmm. do you know, a, a, like get access to their own rights mm -hmm. and justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that matter, I work with uh, community leaders. I, I am a facilitator. I work with materials. I work with project implementation. And as well as, uh, you know, when we talk about SRHR, so the materials and the sensitivity, that, that's where we, you know, we have the proper dialogue and how we can get to people more talking about it in a country where it is still taboo to talk about sexual health and sexual rights. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. in, a, in a short bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we'll keep going. Go yeah, I'm Stephanie from Philippines. Philippines is an archipelago in Southeast Asia, situates in the Western Pacific Ocean. Um, um, according to the UNFPA 2023, we are the 30th most uh, populous country in the world. Uh, we have 109 million uh, household residents, which is comprising 50 of us. 50% of this population is women, and almost uh, one third of these uh, Filipinos is adolescent, ages 10 to 19 years old. Mm, we've been we've been invaded for a numerous uh, foreign. Uh, these invasions shaped Filipinos' cultures, beliefs, traditions. That's un that until now uh, influence and affects the policy maker in implementation of law, law and policies. And I'm just gonna give you a context in our health system in the Philippines. We have a decentralization of health system, which the power of the decision and prioritization of the program are depending on the local executives. So Department of Health just make or develop policies but they cannot enforce the local executives to make a, you know, the, to make prioritize about this program. This setup weakens the delivery system mm -hmm. um, that even that result into uneven health mm -hmm. services, uh, and often overlook or no reproductive health program in some of the most of the uh, local government unit. Um, fortunately, we have a. Uh, Reproductive health law that is passed since 2012. Like uh, works a lot on that. And but April 2013 up to November 2017, um, the Supreme Court uh, filed a and the FDA filed a temporary restricting order. So basically, since April 2013 until November 2017, we don't have a law. Uh, uh, there's no services on contraceptives because of the reason of the because the reason is uh, they're questioning the contraceptive might be abortive right. yes. yes. yeah. mm -hmm. um, the RH law we have a lot of law in the Philippines regarding SRHR but this reproductive health law uh, serve as a overall law framework for SRHR mm -hmm. so it focuses on the maternal mortality uptake of modern contraceptive use uh, post-abortion care, which is not really happening in the Philippines, um, uh, adolescent pregnancy, and on sexually gen sexual gender-based violence. Uh, the communities we uh, we observe that the there's an increasing number of teen pregnancy, but according to the National Demographic Health Survey that was done uh, 2017 to 2022, there's a drastic drops of numbers from of the total fertility rate, fertility rate from 2.7 from 2.7 to 1.9 and the uh, adolescent birth rate from 47 to 21 25 which is really surpass our national target which is 35 but it doesn't uh, uh but it doesn't but there's no um uh, there's no improvements on the contraceptive or family planning services since the data was uh was included during the COVID period, mm -hmm. uh, where the government services diverted their services into the COVID control. 
uh, there's a suspicious that uh, it's just a uh, it's just a pandemic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I am from Likaan Centers for Women's Health. Um, been a nurse since 2015 there until now. Um, this is a, a non-government organization in the Philippines. Um, founded since 1995. Since then, we have, we've been partners to Interpares. Uh, it is established by the group of feminist, mm -hmm. political activists, and community leaders. We believe in human rights, uh, justice, and equality, and the ability of the, of the citizen to transform their community. Um, we, we promote SRHR to the poor and margin, marginalized communities through our three core programs. So we have a three core programs. Uh, we have a community organizing and education where the Likaan heart is there. Um, we do, uh, we, we train women and youth organ, or organization to conduct education on the sexuality, family planning, contraceptives, and we have a clinic, primary health care clinic for women. Uh, we provide contraceptive, antenatal, postnatal care, um, HIV screening and STI treatment, and uh, prevention of cervical cancer. And the last is the advocacy part, where, where we do law and we do national, uh, we do uh, law and policy reform to national and local levels. Mm -hmm. That's all. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, pues muchas gracias a todos y todas por estar aquí hoy. Thanks so much for, to everyone for being here. Eh, pues que les puedo contar de El Salvador, es el país más pequeño de Centroamérica. What to say about El Salvador? It is the smallest country in Central America. Pero lastimosamente tiene problemas muy grandes. But unfortunately it has quite big challenges. Um, es uno de los países con el mayor nivel de embarazos a nivel um, de Centroamérica y de Latinoamérica. It is one of the countries with the highest pregnancy rate in adolescents in the region. Um, y uh, desde hace uh, dos años, un poquito más, se encuentra en un estado de excepción. And for the last two years, the country has been under a state of exception. Eh, esto significa una suspensión a las garantías constitucionales. This means the suspension of uh, constitutional guarantees and rights. Al derecho de la defensa, a la libertad de expresión y a la presunción de inocencia. Uh, this provokes limits uh, to, uh, or, or limits uh, the, the right to defense, the right of uh, freedom of expression, and the presumption of innocence. Y esto lo que ha generado o ha posibilitado es que hayan detenciones arbitrarias a la población salvadoreña. And this has allowed and enabled arbitrary detentions against the Salvadorian population. Que se ha enfocado un poco más en detenciones a eh, defensoras de derechos humanos o a personas que eh, defienden derechos. And they really persecuted and focused on detaining uh, human rights defenders uh, and defenders generally. Eh, y pues tiene um, políticas públicas eh, enfocadas en limitar el acceso a la educación integral en la sexualidad de adolescentes. Eh, el Salvador has public policies that really limit comprehensive sexuality education in the school system. Desde el 2023, eh, pues eh, hay una eh, política de no se permite eh, información acerca de la educación integral en la sexualidad eh, dentro del sistema educativo. Uh, since uh, 2023, there is a policy that uh, limits or, or denies any information about co uh, comprehensive sexuality education within the school system. Eh, esto también en el eh, sistema de salud pública eh, se ha limitado mucho eh, la información y el acceso a medicamentos relacionados con la salud, se eh, la salud sexual y la salud reproductiva. And within the public health care system, similarly, there has been a reduction and an elimination of any information, services, or, or uh, medicine related to sexual health and, recovery, and sexual health and reproductive rights. Y el cierre de algunas iniciativas como son clínicas especializadas para atender personas LGBTIQ+. As well as the, the shutdown of initiatives, like the shutting down of LGBTQ+, uh, 
uh, specific clinics in the country. Eh, y por otro lado tenemos un sistema judicial muy represivo en cuanto a temas de aborto o salud eh, reproductiva. And on top of that we have a justice system that is uh, very uh, uh, draconian when it comes to abortion and reproductive rights. Eh, pues el aborto es eh, eh, un delito en El Salvador, ¿no? Abortion is a crime in El Salvador. Y está bien documentado que se ha criminalizado a mujeres por sufrir emergencia obstétricas. And it's very well documented that uh, women who have suffered miscarriage have ended up in prison. Mm -hmm. Que eh, eh, es una política de un mucho riesgo porque el personal de salud está obligado a dar aviso si sospecha de algún aborto cuando se ha generado alguna emergencia obstétrica fuera del sistema de salud. Uh, and this, this puts everybody at risk because, for instance, uh, staff in the healthcare system are forced to uh, uh, denounce any suspicion of an abortion when a miscarriage takes place. Y pues mi trabajo está un poco enfocado en garantizar el acceso a la educación integral de sexualidad a nivel comunitario. And so my work is uh, really aims to uh, guarantee access to comprehensive sexuality education within the communities. Eh, buscando eh, formas eh, que sean accesibles, que sean lúdicas, de eh, acercar la información a adolescentes, a jóvenes, a mujeres. And for instance, I try to look for accessible, playful uh, forms to bring this information uh, to young people, to adolescents, to women. Eh, con, relacionándolo con eh, música ancestral, arte, pintura, teatro o eh, in, eh, o otras visiones que tengan más que ver con una identidad eh, artística. And so, for instance, we use uh, indigenous music, we use art, painting, theater, and other ways of seeing uh, things. Y también eh, un poco coordinar la relación entre eh, los gobiernos municipales con organizaciones locales que abordan las temáticas relacionadas a la educación integral. Yeah, no, no, no. as well as coordinating the linkages and the relationship between local organizations and local municipalities, specifically local organizations that deal with uh, comprehensive sexuality education. Y pues muchas otras cosas más que con <laughs> And many other things that we'll talk about. Yeah. Oh, lovely, thank you so much. So before we sat down officially, we were unofficially talking about politics and the political climate, right? Um, so I'm wondering if each of you could kind of talk about the context you're working in and how the political context, the political climate helps or hinders your work or the interventions you're, you're able to make into the political climate. Just a little bit of the, of the context, yeah. And we'll start with you, Sherman. Okay, so um, like you, we've seen the video right mm. now. Just, uh, so it's about last year when it was like, Imagine the population of whole on Ontario, so 13 million child brides yeah. under, under the age of 30, so last year. And it was a total 38 million girls who were below 18 got married last year. So child marriage is a big issue and it's uh, even after pandemic it's growing really high, alarming rate. Mm -hmm. So when we work within the communities and we try to find out what are the reasons behind it, we sometimes feel there are multiple reasons about for, for you know the child rights that why instead of being a child go to school play you are put into that pressure or that you know that responsibility of being married and raised in your family in early pregnancy and, and also followed by you know in the case of dowries you followed by gender based violence mm -hmm. so why, why do we think, so we look at our context, yes, we have had uh, uh, women at the top of the government for mm -hmm. almost 25 years, well, more than 25 years, which is like uh, pretty unusual to have a women leader. But still, we see women are treated as a second class citizen in our country. So when it comes to women's health, women's body, we look at societal norms, patriarchal and co capitalistic, you know, capitalistic converge to control women's bodies and choices. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
So poverty is, is could be a reason and also social security of girls because there's a lot of violence going on as well as we feel that uh, when you are surrounded by people with uh, like like different kinds of opinions and values, it's difficult to you know accept uh, what what is not familiar. For example, uh, sex before marriage or in intimacy of the adolescents because we do have subjects like in the curriculum about the comprehensive sexual education we used to have, but unlike as as it is very taboo, people don't feel comfortable about it. So it's taped between the chapters and we do not talk about it in the classroom. But NGOs like us, we do engage adolescents to talk about them and you know they have got questions and as well as the digital, you know, we, we do get into involved into mobiles and technologies. So there are also some misinformations, inaccurate information. So mm -hmm. not talking about them is not going to avoid mm -hmm. that dialogue. Mm -hmm. So what we feel is for the context that we are in right now, uh, recently it's been it's been up like it's been going on that we should not put anything in the curriculum that might upset religious sentiments and you just it could be anything right mm -hmm. because sometimes we feel like when we talk about uh, comprehensive sexuality education we might promoting premarital sex mm -hmm. which is not which is like the opposite right. we talk about good touch bad touch and consent and mm -hmm. how to stay or like prevent pregnancy how to avoid pregnancy and you know, have self sex mm -hmm. and just be aware what is harassment and what is not but I do feel when we talk about like 68 almost 65 <coughs> to 68 million youth in my country right now and it's a big number mm -hmm. if you don't concentrate on them in if you don't concentrate on their health mm -hmm. it's going to you know hit back us mm -hmm. as, as a whole community as a whole country but like Bangladesh is committed to achieve SDG 3 and also with the help of the cooperations, like international cooperations, we do have uh, like uh, the interventions are planned to you know support those uh, commitments. But I do feel when it comes to this social norms mm -hmm. based on women's access, women's choice, and also sexual and reproductive health and rights, we do focus on reproductive health mm -hmm. and rights, like pregnancy, childbirth. Uh, abortion, like unlike the country that we've heard today, Philippines and El Salvador, it is still not illegal to uh, get an abortion in Bangladesh because after 1971, is just to give a quick background, like uh, when we have uh, independence from Pakistan, so there were thousands and thousands of women were raped and impregnated by Pakistani militaries. So in 1971, when we got independence, so it was allowed for us to, you know, a woman can go up to 12 weeks for an abortion, but they don't call it abortion. So you just, there's another a discourse, like how we put the words in. So it is called menstrual regulation. Mm -hmm. So that's how it's, it's, it's not criminalized mm -hmm. in Bangladesh. But uh, like I said, we do see the health professionals, the service providers, they sometimes show fear and hostility when you go to them for abortions or, you know, if you, if you say that I don't want it. Mm -hmm. Or even sometimes the uh, cons contraception. contraceptions. Mm -hmm. Like we still believe that the religious stigma and that the, uh, the choice is not up to you. Like you have to ask permission from your family members if you want to get access to contraceptives. Mm -hmm. it, in rural areas, not just rural areas, it, in middle class families as well. Mm -hmm. we, if we go to any health uh, like hospitals, it's not easy to talk about uh, sexual health and reproductive health, especially if you are not married and sexually active. You don't think about going to a doctor and just get a pap smear. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes even more difficult for transgender persons in our countries, right. or transsexual persons to get access to those, yeah. those services in our country. Yeah. So when we have laws and policies, yes, we do not have an SRHR policy, but it is part of the adolescent health strategy and the popul health populations law that we have that you know prevents uh, gender-based violence and take care of you know mother motherhood and mortality rate and all those all those things. But in we see implementation gap everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like we have law against child marriage. Like mm -hmm. we have uh, like uh, the legal age of marriage is 18 and 21, and yet I I told you the number that's mm -hmm. so high mm -hmm. because. There's the special cases. There's a clause. There's a loophole in the uh, in the in the law that if 
your permission if you get permission from your parents and the local like counselor or local authority you can get your children get married mm -hmm. even when when they're 13 or 14 mm -hmm. so this is where we the context and the politics comes in mm -hmm. that you have to decide which is pro people you, you don't like keep uh, like loop area so that people take advantage and disadvantage mm -hmm. of the situations mm -hmm. and coming forward we do not know how things are going because it's, we see a lot of uh, political unrest going on in Bangladesh and uh, we, 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 we do think that it's, it's becoming more challenging when you talk about the sexuality part mm -hmm. in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Russell. Do you want to follow up on any of that? No. <laughs> no. Stephanie, do you want? Yeah, fortunately we have a reproductive health law, but the law and the implementation mechanism could not overcome the challenges posed by the fragmented health system, geographical and economic inequities, and uh, gender norm pervasive, and the constraint on the sexual and reproductive, uh, reproductive uh, autonomy, which is the, uh, there's a, um, there's a taboo on a SRHR mm -hmm. it, that is most obvious on the in the cases of abortions, mm -hmm. where there are no local estimations, routine count on the post-abortion care that is mandated in the law or even in the IRR. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, still, the Likhaan continuously engaged to the Department of Health for the focusing on the reproductive health program, to the Dep Ed. Uh, for the uh, for Commission of Population and Development for SRHR policies for the Dep Ed for the Comprehensive Se Sexuality Education, this CSE is uh, part of the reproductive law since 2012. But um, only in 2018, uh, Likhaan contributed in guiding in making the standard guidelines in 2018, and only 2024. Uh, it's starting now to to implement the CSE in a three in the only three regions where the there's a high teen pregnancy rate mm -hmm. and the religious groups starting their sentiments. So what Lika and doing right now, we uh, we have a limitations to go in school. So what we are doing is uh, we give uh, comprehensive sexuality education in the out of school youth through our community mobilizing a uh, community organizing group. And and we already and we also engage in the human rights for the SRHR violation. Um, in the clinic part, uh, since the RH law uh, stated there that we are not uh, health providers does not allow to provide services to the adolescents if they don't obtain parental consent. But this is a gray matter of the law, so there's no violations. So Lika and clinics provide services to the to all the adolescents so we advocate the health the other health providers to be brave to provide this to the adolescents so yeah and right now uh we have a field field health this is the health care insurance in the philippines but right now they return a lot of money to the government even though we have a bad health system so we are afraid that uh in the next few years, in the next few months, uh, we don't have commodities to provide to the Filipinos. Mm -hmm. And, and, or, but because you can avail services in the Philippines if you are PhilHealth accredited. Uh, if you feel health member, as free, but a lot of women, and a lot of, a lot of women are, don't have a job. So they can't pay the premium amount of mm -hmm. PhilHealth uh, membership. And even the adolescent, are they are under to their parents right. so yes. if they use the field help to uh, to claim the mm -hmm. services their parents might know so right. they they rather to have pregnant you know mm -hmm. they rather go to the high risk pregnancy than mm -hmm. yeah so. oh. and Wendy you've already told us quite a bit about your political context but is there anything else you wanted to add around that yeah okay. Eh, sí, eh, es yes. muy complejo eh, porque eh, todas estas limitaciones lo que hacen es eh, no garantizar eh, la, el cumplimiento de los derechos humanos. Eh, it is quite complex because what these limitations end up doing is that they restrain uh, human rights. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
eh, sobre todo porque se suman a los problemas estructurales del país, la pobreza, eh, la violencia sexual, la inseguridad. Eh, because they add on to structural problems that are already uh, in the country, like poverty, sexual violence. Uh, eh, violencia sexual, pobreza y, este, y lack of uh, rights. <laughs> Eh, eh, también eh, debido al estado de excepción, las defensoras de derechos humanos eh, estamos en riesgo de ser detenidas de manera arbitraria. And on top of that, uh, defenders, the human rights defenders, are not also at risk of being arbitrarily detained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sí, y como también eh, este proceso del estado de excepción eh, ha aumentado los tiempos del proceso judicial, ¿no? Pasamos de eh, un proceso de que duraba un año o, o, o seis meses a procesos que duran dos años o más. Uh, and this has also created a delay in the court system. So cases that used to take, for instance, a year, six months, now can take two and even more time to, to be processed within the state of exception. Mm -hmm. Claro. Y la otra cosa es la limitación a, 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 a los espacios de incidencia pública como las instituciones del Estado. Uh, another thing is the, the how limited the spaces of advocacy within the state are mm -hmm. now. Que evita el acceso a, a, a la garantía de los derechos de las adolescentes y la juventud salvadoreña. And this further uh, restrains the access to, to rights of adolescents and women in, in Salvador. Y sobre todo el derecho a la justicia a mujeres sobrevivientes de violencia especially the right to justice for women survivors, survivors of violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Wendy, maybe I'll, I'll keep you on the hot seat, and could you walk us through kind of the, t like the kind of work you're doing, a typical day maybe, mm -hmm. to, I'm sure every day is different and you're doing all kinds of things, but maybe some examples of some of the kind of typical days for you. Mm -hmm. Pues eh, yo eh, trabajo en Santa Ana, que es un eh, departamento del país. I work in Santa Ana, which is one of the departments in the country. Y eh, es muy complejo porque eh, el acceso que se tiene a los servicios eh, básicos es muy limitado. ¿no? It's quite complex there because access to basic uh, services there is, is, are very limited. Y pues lo primero que hago es eh, llegar a la oficina y revisar mis actividades del día. The first thing I do is get to the office and see what I, what I have in, in agenda. Eh, generalmente me traslado a otras partes del de, de, de occidente del país. More likely than not, I go to other parts within the western region of the, of the country, which is where Santana is. Eh, y pues voy a... Eh, un poco contarles acerca de un trabajo muy bonito que estamos haciendo con adolescentes. And I'm, I'm going to tell you as an example uh, a very beautiful work that we're currently doing with adolescents. Eh, pues desarrollamos una estrategia para eh, unir el tema del de arte con la educación integral en sexualidad eh, con un grupo de adolescentes eh, de entre 13 y 19 o 20 años. So one of our strategies has been to bring together art and comprehensive sexuality education uh, with youth and adolescents between 13 and 19 years of age. Entonces ese proceso consiste en llegar, a hacer una presentación de nuestro estado de ánimo, nuestro eh, estado en el momento. And so the way we do this work is we arrive and then we do a little a sharing on how we're feeling, our well-being on that particular day. Eh, alguna dinámica de activación, bailar, eh, some can, activation dynamic like dancing for instance, mm -hmm. eh, cantar o, o hacer algo divertido, singing or just doing something fun together. De ahí nos enfocamos en el desarrollo de la temática, then we develop the topic, eh, ya sea prevención de violencia, prevención de embarazo, eh, que tiene que ver más con anticonceptivos o eh, qué es la educación sexual o cómo funciona la educación sexual para desarrollar y cumplir un plan de vida. 
uh, or if these topics, for instance, can be about violence prevention, about the prevention of pregnancy, uh, specifically tied to contraceptive, as well as uh, com a comprehensive sexuality education and how it is related to people fulfilling their li life plans. Mm -hmm. Después, eh, pues los jóvenes eh, tienen que hacer una propuesta artística de qué eh, dibujo plantear después de eh, instrucciones técnicas de cómo pintar, cómo hacer murales. So we provide them some technical uh, knowledge about painting murals and they have to come up with a proposal uh, about how to uh, explore the topic that we've discussed through their paintings and, and murals. Y luego se lleva la propuesta a la municipalidad para los permisos para plasmarlo en la vía pública. And so we take these proposals to the municipality so that they give us the right to, to, put, mm -hmm. to, to put these murals into the walls of the municipality. Claro. Y posteriormente, pues, regreso a la oficina para sistematizar todo. And then I get back to the office just to systematize all of the information. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Stephanie. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I do clinical work again, mm -hmm. uh, contraceptives and well counseling, especially to those adolescents who wants to what are what to use contraceptive, what are the side effects, you know. Mm -hmm. We also allotted one day per week, which is the Saturday for them, uh, for to encourage them to to continuously uh, return to clinic. Um, right now, uh, we and my team waiting for the passage of the Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Bill, uh, which is uh, allowing the, the 16 years old and above to have a contraceptive reproductive health services without parental consent and uh, com uh, the implementation of comprehensive sexuality education to all the schools. And this year I had the a teen, each, a teen Pregnancy Prevention Campaign. We trained a, a, a group of young women leaders to have a, to, we train them to have a negotiation, face-to-face -face policy dialogue, for them to they can uh, they can do advo advocacy in their local government, mm -hmm. and and sometimes we are invited to some schools, universities to provide comprehensive sexuality education. Mm -hmm. So um, we also I I also do we also do teleconsult. It is an uh, innovation that happened during pandemic. Mm -hmm. So um, through teleconsultation, we reach a lot of people, not in our communities. Uh, we, let, we, we reach uh, even in the part where mm -hmm. uh, areas, um, we give consultation, um, because, uh, because consultation and contraceptive, we even, if they can't come to the clinic, we even uh, deliver it to their, yeah. And during pandemic, we do meet up for, for those. Uh, thank you for the vehicle that was given by the Interpares. So we are, we are able to meet the adolescent who doesn't want to go to the clinic even if mm -hmm. we encourage them or we convince them to do. We even meet up, meet them up at the parking lot mm -hmm. or even in the, in the, in the, uh, in the you know, in, anywhere they like mm -hmm. to provide them. We even do the implant insertion mm -hmm. uh, and counseling and shots. Mm -hmm. And before I am part of the, we have a maternal clinic before in Lekaan, but we can't sustain that. Mm -hmm. So I am part of the, I assist the midwife before. Uh -huh. But now, only the uh, contraceptive family, standalone family, family planning clinic. Mm -hmm. And that's all. Thank you. Uh, well, I I will not talk like like one person because I I, I believe I represent the mm -hmm. community of uh, activists that yes. I work with. Yeah. So it's it's more than just a uh, development professionals. We believe that we are here to with more passion to bring social change and social justice. So I work with the uh, community organizers. Like uh, we don't have any like designations in this uh, in a, in my NGO. We all are organizers. We are cultural organizers, training facilitators, and we're all like, it's a flat organization, mm -hmm. and it's a feminist organization, which which is not very usual in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. You know, NGOs call themselves as feminist organization. So I 
work with the community uh, organizer facilitators uh, to we work in more than 10,000 villages in Bangladesh in 14 districts so right now we have uh, the organizations that have uh, group members we have in total 0.24 million group members and more than half of them are women mm -hmm. and as well as we have almost 1500 adolescents in the in the groups as well and when it comes to my day-to-day -day work yeah we do travel from one place to another uh, to facilitate sessions to have dialogues even I facilitate sessions on SRHR with adolescents and trust me the questions they <laughs> ask sometimes also you know catch me off guard uh, uh, yeah interesting questions and I feel like it, did I ever ask this to anyone at, at their age no, I did not but then I also uh, interact with with the communities uh, I, I interact with the parents the guardians and the teachers as well sometimes like what are the challenges they face mm -hmm. because what are the issues you know because uh, our field staff also live within the communities like they do they they share a home together like they they live with the with the community and uh, it's not just a like five nine to five job it's it's uh, you call it like even yesterday I, I had a phone call from one of the adolescents you know from Rongpur and they, they were just like giving me some examples like what they do because we do have like you show, you saw the pictures of the cycle rallies mm -hmm. you know the villages where still women it's difficult to go out for women and girls without proper you know attire like there's a certain attire that you have to go out with mm -hmm. to for us the girls that we work with you know cycling and with a slogan that's saying, uh, my body, my choice. This, this is something that uh, we do not do like every day, but this is something that we highlight. Mm -hmm. Like we, we bring out them for practicing football, like soccer, mm -hmm. yes, yes. to play kabaddi. And you know, the, it's just, it is a little gendered when it comes to uh, what women can do and cannot do mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. communities. Mm -hmm. So we do have to have that dialogue constantly going like what, let's not limit our dreams let's not limit our mobility mm -hmm. so this is a constant conversation that we have to take like with with the parents with the communities and everyone around it because uh, my like um, our, our colleagues our colleagues it, it's it's a constant battle for them <laughs> because it's not like everybody will you know become uh, the mountaineers or something like that because sometimes the personal journey the struggle of coming out of their own home own, own house's door is a, is a battle enough. So we, de we do see that and we, I also personally work with uh, survivors of rape, sexual harassment and uh, you know to be with them, to you know stand with them because it's a traumatic mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. As well as we talk to like the counselors. I, I do facilitate sessions. I talk, I, like I said, I, I work with you know, materials and facilitation and how to have these sensitive dialogues without hurting anyone, mm -hmm. without you know, creating more misinformation. So mm -hmm. this is something that we back at what we do. We engage in conversations and dialogue. Mm -hmm. well, as we take a quick peek at the time, and I have to pick which questions I want to ask. So all right. Why I'd like to hear about your pathways into the work, how you got to the, to do this work, how your how you keep how your passion was developed, how you maintain your passion. So your your pathway and your passion. I'll start with you, Andy. Pues, eh, yo creo que la oportunidad que tenemos las personas de transformar nuestro entorno es lo que apasiona. I think that the opportunity that we have to uh, transform the environment that we're in is something that brings a lot of passion to people. Mm -hmm. eh, saber que las niñas pueden cumplir con sus metas de vida sin eh, llevar cuesta arriba un embarazo. Eh, to know that girls can accomplish their goals without having to carry an unwanted pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Y pues el cumplimiento y la garantía de la libertad de las mujeres and the fulfillment and the guarantees of women's uh, rights. Y pues la energía feminista de mis compañeras. And the feminist energy of my of my compañeras. Mm -hmm. Pero cómo tú llegaste al trabajo? Um, yo creo que eh, um, la, la historia individual de las personas pues inspira a eh, buscar una vocación. The 
personal and individual stories that people go through is something that oftentimes inspire you to join something like this. Yeah. Yo vengo de una comunidad eh, salvadoreña de un entorno de mucha pobreza. I come from a, a community in El Salvador. It's, a, it's an environment of, of, of a lot of poverty. Y eh, tener acceso a la educación integral en sexualidad pues fue algo para mí eh, muy valioso. For me to have access to comprehensive sexuality education was something very valuable. Mm -hmm. eh, yo recibí un proceso eh, que estaba apoyado por Interpares eh, con la colectiva. Uh, I took part in a, in a process, in, a, in some workshops, mm -hmm. through la colectiva, thanks to the work of Interpares. Eh, y eh, pues me apasionó el tema. Mm -hmm. And I became passionate mm -hmm. with the topic. Y, eh, Investigué más, me formé más en el tema y eh, posteriormente empecé a trabajar eh, con la colectiva en la temática. And I did more research, I learned more, I studied more, and became even more passionate and then started actually working with la colectiva. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. You know, I witnessed, I've been a nurse in Lecan, so I witnessed uh, a lot of struggles and discrimination that uh, the, the adult adolescents faced mm -hmm. experience. There was there was one story I will want to share. There was a 17 year old came to play me, um, claiming her rights for contraceptive. So uh, we put her the implant, mm -hmm. and after the few few days, her mother came to us shouting and threatening us. Why are you put uh, mm -hmm. implant mm -hmm. to, our, to my daughter without parental consent? Mm -hmm. The girl is in the side, very devastating. Where I'm sad, you know, so we just uh, we just remove the implant because we can't uh, we can't blame the mother because until now the they they have they don't have comprehens comprehensive sexuality education so they they don't have enough information so after a few days uh, the the adolescent return and I do provide them the shots yes. that the mother can felt yes, anymore. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you mm -hmm. know um, I just realized that. Uh, we need more advocates that, mm -hmm. like us to ensure that every girl uh, will reach their own full potentials and by amplifying their demands. Because every girl denies in claiming the, their SRHR. Mm -hmm. um, every girl will face a ha severe risk like high risk for pregnancy, mm -hmm. and sexual abuse, mm -hmm. and even mental changes. Mm -hmm. So that what, that, what is, that what is the reason that pushes me to stay in this kind of career. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Oh, it's an excellent question, wonderful question. I end up asking myself again mm, and again. I bet. Uh, <laughs> because my background is different. I used to work for, you know, skills, education, you know, training, trainers and stuff like that. But it's a, it's a more like a personal journey for me because during my time, uh, my journey from one door to another door during the infertility clinics mm. that I, I went to, I saw the struggle. I, I saw my, you know, the, the curve of my experiences that how women are treated differently because of their abilities and disabilities sometimes and mm -hmm. capabilities. Mm -hmm. So it drove me and uh, I saw the women, you know, the fellow patients, how they were, you know, evaluating their worth, their, their, you know, they're facing judgmental comments or, you know, looks and behaviors and attitudes. So, I recently worked with, like it's been more than, like less than two years with Nijera Kodi. So mm -hmm. I switched here because I wanted to talk with not only just adolescents but the women also, that you do not put your self-worth on the bodily autonomy, mm -hmm. and not just your, you know, you're not there to just deliver. Mm -hmm. You know, the reproduction is the, not the only thing that we are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. As well as we get to work with health prov professionals the service providers, because I remember it was a traumatic experience for me to go to a doctor and talk to them. Mm -hmm. Like it was my fault, mm -hmm. I was guilty, I felt uh, I didn't have a self-worth. Mm -hmm. And it, it took me time to you know get back uh, the confidence in me. So I feel the later generations, like my nieces and my nephews, they don't go through the same thing that I did. Mm -hmm. And also I expect that through these dialogues, we can also, uh, exchange and extend the conversation of care and compassion when it becomes, you know, the when we talk about SRHR issues, it's so sensitive. It's it's because it's difficult for a country because 
we girls do not feel comfortable to talk about our periods with our mothers sometimes let alone with someone else mm -hmm. but it's just it's so natural thing and it's 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 a it's it's a necessity mm -hmm. it's an essential part so just because of stigmatizing and you know sh shaming mm -hmm. we often uh, don't look at it and we we struggle and we see a lot of, lot of deaths mm -hmm. and harsh consequences so we believe that we need to have more dialogues and tell people it's okay to talk about it and if you do not get access we should you know talk to those who can provide those accesses mm -hmm. not just information also the access to the services mm -hmm. wonderful so I'm probably going to have time for one more question, but I wanted to just let the audience know that there will be a chance for questions. So think about some good questions that you want to ask our panel. And I'm aware that I've had the privilege of hogging all of the questions. So were there any questions that you wanted to ask? Well, I guess my question is, we talked a little bit about the context in New Brunswick, where we've just recently had a change of government. The new government hasn't taken power yet. One of, I mean, aside from the tremendous relief I feel at the change of government in New Brunswick, I feel a little bit unsure um, that we'll sustain the movements in the province to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have advice for us on kind of combating yeah. maybe a sense of, of like, oh, things will be great now because there's still going to be lots of work to do. Um, so yeah, how do you? Your contexts are different than ours, but but how do how what do you what do you have to tell us about our context? Mm -hmm. Maybe. I I feel like of course uh, like we we've, we've come here from you know traveling after three more places in mm -hmm. Canada. Luckily, mm -hmm. and we got to talk to more people. So like I can tell you that our in my, in my country there's still this uh, you know uh, penal code. Uh, 1860 section 377 where we do not have like we don't get uh, LGBTQI plus mm plus -hmm. no it's, it's it's still we do not we can go to jail for promoting it and sometimes talking about it mm -hmm. but which is I do hope and I don't advise I just hope that for New Brunswick it doesn't come back like that mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that is something that like mm -hmm. because we're really working and pushing to do that in mm -hmm. Bangladesh is just that you know let people live mm -hmm. let people just be Yes. And yeah. uh, and when it comes to this women, I, I I heard because access again is an issue for Canada because of such a big location wise yes. and it's also yes. economical thing economical barriers are there as yes. well. So I do hope that even not for just New Brunswick but all over ba like the country mm -hmm. because when we we made business out of women's necessities, yeah. so the products that we use, we have to use the menstruation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sanitary napkins mm -hmm. and whatever. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we pay so much money and it's mm -hmm. how many of us can actually afford us? I mean mm -hmm. looking back my communities where I work, it's mm -hmm. very expensive and it's it's not easy. Mm -hmm. As well as if you want to become a mother, that again, mm -hmm. the medical facilities they are so expensive. And if you don't want to get pregnant, the contraceptives are also mm -hmm. expensive. Mm -hmm. So you understand so Real necessities of women, I, I just, I, I was just telling this to Natalia, I think, last night. If men were to have periods and had to deliver babies, pads would be free, <laughs> and we would have like one year, two years of paid uh, paternal <laughs> leave. Yeah. So I just hope yeah. that we, we look at women issues in a different lens. Mm -hmm. I hope we get to have that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. point of view. Yeah. yeah, for me, it's, you know, the art issue in the Philippines, uh, uh, almost phase 14 year long battle before it passed and in 2013 to 2017 but it's really a long battle um, yeah. I just want to uh, advise that don't stop doing yeah. doing these things yeah. don't stop advocacy and yeah. don't stop demanding so let's encourage uh, to to join us more and speak out until speak out voice out until we heard mm -hmm. by them and until we we uh, get our goal. Yes. <laughs> okay. eh, pues yo igual creo que eh, estamos en resiliencia constante. Similarly, I, I would say we're in constant resiliency. Mm -hmm. Y yo creo que lo importante es eh, tener en claro que la meta es eh, la garantía de los derechos. 
I think we just need to remind ourselves constantly that the goal is to have access to rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eh, enfocarnos en un trabajo colectivo to focus on collective work. Mm -hmm. Estamos en una realidad para que el trabajo sea cada vez más colectivo y pensar mucho en el cuidado individual y and en la protección colectiva. Eh, to think a lot about self-care, but also collective uh, safety. Mm -hmm. Y mm -hmm. en la medida de lo posible, el garantizar el acceso a la salud mental. And uh, as, as, as much as possible to ensure access to mental health mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. Que es tan importante en los contextos. Mm -hmm. um, Which is so important in this kind of context. Eh, porque nosotras bailar al inicio de los procesos es parte fundamental, ¿no? Because for us to dance before starting a day of workshops is fundamental to the work we're doing. Mm -hmm. Porque eh, mm -hmm. es un grupo vivo que no, que no se deja del sistema, ¿no? Because it's a, it's a group that's alive, that mm -hmm. is not going to uh, allow the system to do what it wants with it. Y pues si nos quitan la libertad de ser felices, pues ahí sí habremos perdido. <laughs> Because if they take away our, our right to be happy, and then we've lost everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Really powerful, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have some time for questions from the floor. If there's anyone in the audience that has any questions they would like to ask, this is your chance. Questions or comments? Yes. Yeah. Notes of appreciation? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I know. I don't want to rush people, so we'll like sit with silence for But yes, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Sarah. I'm with the Action Canada. Mm -hmm. So first of all, thanks so much for coming here in your months. Mm -hmm. It's really nice to have you and hear your mm -hmm. stories. And it's just this very timely, I think, because um, mm -hmm. despite of having everything online, it's nice to have people like face to face. Mm -hmm. And it also aligns with the campaign that we're doing right now here to get on and put top, yes. top offline, the, the thing like that. Mm -hmm. So. It's nice to hear your stories. And also just want to share, um, I think, a takeaway from what I've like, um, kind of um, realized where you guys are talking. It's like, I'm an immigrant too, I'm from the Philippines. And like here, and I think some of, most of us are students are immigrants, like life here is really comfortable as, a, as compared to the, the kind of life they used to live. Mm -hmm. And given that, sometimes we kind of forget all the struggles that we used to fight. Like, our struggle to have um, our basic healthcare need, mm -hmm. our struggle for clean air, transportation, mm -hmm. rights, and everything, because they're in a comfortable place. Mm -hmm. But then I kind of appreciate this kind of conversation to remind us like, we need to safeguard the rights mm -hmm. we're having here in Canada. Mm -hmm. Like, we need to safeguard this. Um, yes, we can access contraceptives now, like pharmacare. Yes, we can access all of those things in the clinic. Yes, we do have great social development. But if we don't like really safeguard it, like the force, you know, you can hear in the news, That's you right. can hear in like social media, there's a lot of backlash yes. right now with yes. reproductive justice, with human rights, even human rights. Yes. yes. There's a lot of questions going on in that. So if we don't safeguard those rights, it's been fought for like decades and like years and years by this old, like other people. We're gonna lose it, even if we live in Canada. Mm -hmm. Even if this is like a like first world country, we can snap a finger. Exactly. So like it's also nice to hear that there's a global, mm -hmm. like uh, like a international solidarity going on. And I feel like as um, Canadians, I'm not a Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like people who are in Canada are also part of that, yeah. especially yeah. immigrants, especially us. That like. Um, there's a lot of like different things that are we struggle to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's nice. I'm really thankful for, for this mm -hmm. international solidarity mm -hmm. that you guys are showing. So if they can do it in their countries, that, like El Salvador is like very restrictive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know Bangladesh too, the patriarchy there is, I do have a few friends from Bangladesh and telling you stories of how is it hard to like advocate for mm -hmm. your rights. When they can do it, mm -hmm. we can also do it here. Like, Canada is more like relaxed and <laughs> accommodating, yeah. and, you know. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think thank there's you. a. Sorry, <coughs> I'm just saying thank you to her. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I think we we can be a little complacent, right? Mm-hmm. That we've made progress in some areas, and certainly social media, the news, our neighbors to the south, a rising opposition forms in the Canadian government, the local context of how things have been in New Brunswick under the Conservative government. Yeah, like mm-hmm. there's you can never take your foot off the gas, right? Mm-hmm. There's always there's always going to be pressure to to go to. Re- into retrenchment and the removal of rights and the controlling of particular bodies in particular ways. Yeah, so thank you for that. Anything else? Just thinking about Sarah's comment, and it makes me think also about, so you use the word solidarity, mm-hmm. and, and thinking about the ways that these connections are important and the Action Canada campaign, which I think is really powerful, and the ways that, including in Canada, communities are pitted against one another, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the main things that our outgoing premier of New Brunswick tried to do unsuccessfully was to suggest that newcomers mm-hmm. to New Brunswick didn't want sexual and reproductive health and rights, right? So to try and, and break any potential solidarity there. Mm-hmm. And I, I think he was unsuccessful, but I think that that campaign and your comment remind yeah. me that like this is the work we still have to do. We need to continue to build these relationships. Um, And it does require us to to be in touch with one another, maybe more than than over social media, so yeah. And the scapegoat, thinking about like sexual and reproductive health and rights in this context, there's a lot of scapegoating of newcomers and immigrants Mm -hmm. around like the healthcare crisis. Mm -hmm. And, and, And I think we have to be really careful that we don't let that story become the dominant story, right? That we push back on that mm-hmm. and see the interconnectedness mm-hmm. between mm-hmm. sexual and reproductive health and rights and immigration and newcomers safety and all of that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think this is all Yeah, so I feel like for me it was like really different. Um in school and like I did I'm from India. So how you view like I don't know, sex before marriage or like contraceptives, you don't talk about it as much. And it's like a taboo, like menstruation is a taboo, as you were saying. And coming to Canada, I like understand for newcomers, they're still coming with that, like how they grew up in that society. They still, there's so much unlearning to do because you are grown up in the society, you're not supposed to talk about sex, you're not supposed to talk about periods, periods are dirty. Mm-hmm. And then you come here, and it's different you can actually talk about it there are more clinics so i do understand like even if situations like worse uh way worse in back home i do get like how for newcomers it is a challenge to to the unlearn and i feel like personally i had to do a lot of that um raised up in india brought up in this culture where everything is considered taboo and then coming back here yeah, it's, I just want to share and I like thank you so much for sharing all of this and just being together here from different parts of the world. And it's really showing that even though all these issues are in different parts of the world, it's all the same problem, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Even uh, about menstruation, I've worked with women in like India where uh, I remember one of the girls were telling me she did not have access to sanitary pads, mm-hmm. so she used her bra as a pad, and the wire tragically got stuck in her body. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's just so, it's, it's really sad that, and here too, there's previous poverty. Mm-hmm. We don't have, have access to pads. It's mm-hmm. so expensive mm-hmm. to get pads, and even any sort of like contraceptives, menstrual cups, tampons. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm so grateful to like really hear you guys and know that we're all part of this. That's like to get it's global, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and I think that's something like I appreciate about our three uh, counterparts and, and some of the work we try to do at Interbaris is it's precisely that. It's like they mentioned kind of structural issues as barriers. Mm-hmm. It's not just like like the taboos around it, but it's like precisely structural issues mm-hmm. like poverty that mm-hmm. sometimes get on the way of people you know, uh, uh, accessing the best type of, of, of uh, uh, care that they can get in terms of reproductive health and rights. So, so I, that's work that they're doing, and obviously they're approaching it in, in different ways and through different strategies, but it's always, you know, coming back to the fact that it's, the marginalization is mm-hmm. behind this, and, mm-hmm. and uh, poverty is behind it. So, mm-hmm. so yeah. yeah. Thank you for your so yeah. 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 I 
think that's the time yeah, we have. I was gonna say, I didn't unfortunately. Finish so maybe if we can have a big round of applause <laughs> for the presenters. <laughs> and Talia will pass it back to you to say the, the last few things. Yes. yes. Um, so first of all, thanks to everyone here for, for coming out today, this Friday evening. <laughs> um, I am, um, you know, it's, it's been great. We were very excited to come here to New Brunswick after the, the results of the election, <laughs> so we precisely hear yeah, it, you know, because yeah. when I think the, the, the tour was in, in planning, we were like the East Coast, you know, has all of these challenges, and we were mm. definitely thinking about mm. New Brunswick, and so mm. we want to learn about how this process went, and it's mm. been lovely talking to you, you know, during this conversation, mm. but prior to it, too, so thanks so much for, for uh, hosting this, to Jack Mead, uh, thanks so much for helping us organize this, it's been great. Uh, to Rita, who is behind the scenes but really organizes this, this uh, event with Interpares, and Drs. Krista and, and, and Chris, Christiana, Christiana yeah. as well uh, for Mount Allison, as well as our co sponsors, Birth Justice Initi Initiative, Canadian Health Coalition, uh, New Brunswick Media Co-op, Action Canada for Sexual right, uh, Health and Rights, Reproductive Justice New Brunswick, Global Affairs Canada, which is supporting this tour. Our amazing participants that have been just, it's been such a luxury getting to know them and their work, mm -hmm. as well as their organization this last couple of weeks and, and everybody here. Uh, we have some didactic material as well as some forms in case you wanna learn more about our work. So that's my little pitch here. <laughs> uh, and yeah, thanks for, for everybody.